In this video, we are doing a deep dive into eggs, which are one of the most unique ingredients on the planet. They have almost unlimited use cases from being eaten as a protein or can be used as an ingredient in sauces like mayo, the yolks in pasta, or the whites to a meringue. However, there is something I've wondered for years. Are the more expensive eggs actually worth it? Lately, like a lot of other grocery items, egg prices have only gone up. The lowest cost I saw in the store was just 15 cents per egg, while the most expensive was 92 cents per egg. Which may not sound like a lot, but if you were eating an egg or two for breakfast most days, that can add up to a couple of hundred dollars per year. Not to mention, there is a ton of confusing information about exactly what is better about more expensive eggs. For example, does the yolk color actually correlate to a better tasting one? Well, that changes with this video. Those who say that expensive eggs are worth it will typically cite an answer under one of these three reasons. One, expensive eggs are more ethical and humane. Two, expensive eggs are healthier for you. And three, expensive eggs taste better. So these are the questions you will be able to answer by the end of this video, along with many other questions you probably have. My goal is to lay out all the information so you can make an informed and confident decision the next time you are at the grocery store. So where do we begin? Well, first, let's take a step back and learn how the egg became a mass-produced commodity where today, a single laying hen can produce 300 eggs per year, leading to a total U.S. egg production of almost 100 billion. Let me tell you the two reasons why today's sponsor Made In makes my favorite nonstick cookware that you'll be seeing in this video. One, these pans are oven safe up to 500 degrees and they are double cured. So this service will last a lot longer than other nonstick pans and 70 times longer than ceramic nonstick surfaces. And I've used this eight inch pan for the past year and a half or so and it's still in really great shape, just like this brand new one right here. However, the second reason of what's make these special is actually what's underneath. Maiden uses their five ply stainless steel underneath the nonstick coating, meaning this pan will heat evenly and quickly for not just eggs, but searing or charring vegetables and proteins that you don't want to stick. You'll see me using these nonstick pans throughout the video, so head to the link in my description to save on your order. But now let's learn a little bit about egg history. One of the reasons why chickens were domesticated was for their prolific egg-laying abilities. And some fowl only lay a set number of eggs at a time. Chickens, on the other hand, keep laying eggs until they've gathered a full nest. So if an egg is taken by a predator or a human, the hen will continue to lay eggs indefinitely in hopes of filling up her nest with eggs. And can you imagine how important this discovery was for early humans? According to On Food and Cooking, because of a chicken's ability to provide almost unlimited food, chickens were actually valued more for their egg production than for their meat. And chickens likely became domesticated around 7 to 10,000 years ago, and by contrast, dairy milking actually began a few thousand years later. Today, though, the modern egg-laying chicken is a product of genetic optimization with very little remaining diversity among industrial breeds. In the chicken breast video, we covered how the massive modern broiler chickens are a cross between the Cornish and Plymouth chicken varieties for maximum breast size. For egg production chickens, though, most are actually a result of crossing four parent varieties, the Cornish and the Plymouth for size, then the White Leghorn and the Rhode Island Red for egg laying talents and improved shell color. And starting in the 20th century, mass egg production took off, thanks to these optimized genetics and the rise of industrialization. Now, a single production facility might have 100,000 to over a million laying chickens at once. And most of these chickens live their life inside under bright lights and temperature regulating devices, eat a manufactured diet, and live for about a year or two during which they lay two to 300 eggs or about one per day. Once their egg production decreases though, they are sent off for slaughter. However, because these chickens are older, if you remember from the chicken breast video, most supermarket chickens are six to 14 weeks old for meat, these old egg laying chickens won't be used for human food, but likely for protein feed or pet food production. Now, the ROI on chicken feed to eggs is crazy. Three pounds of commercial feed can turn into one pound of eggs and sold for a much higher price, of course. While broiler chickens can gain one pound of meat for every two pounds of feed, they can only be slaughtered once, yielding maybe four pounds of meat. Egg-laying chickens, on the other hand, can be fed over and over and produce more food mass. 
Those 300 eggs they produce each year may weigh two ounces or about 55 grams, leading to 30 to 40 pounds of eggs. Keep in mind though, these numbers only apply to female chickens or hens. Male chicks are actually euthanized with gas or macerated minutes or hours after hatching since they provide no economic value to egg production facilities. Aside from the living conditions of the hens, the discarding of male chicks is one of the top cited ethical considerations for mass produced eggs. And this actually happens at facilities making cage free, organic, and even free range eggs. We'll talk a bit more about these terms in a bit. However, new technology is beginning to be used where eggs can be scanned prior to hatching to determine the sex of the eggs, meaning male eggs can be discarded before they actually hatch. And facilities in Europe have begun to adopt this technology and it will likely become more common worldwide. I'll leave an article and a link if you want to learn more. It's actually pretty cool. Needless to say, chicken eggs have been and will continue to be a super important part of human history and our diets. It's estimated by the WSDE that in 2024, the average American will consume 293 eggs per person or a little over 24 dozen. However, if the average home cook is going to be using a couple hundred eggs per year, I think it's important to know what we are paying for when trying to evaluate whether we should buy a $2 or potentially $10 dozen of eggs at the grocery store. So let's answer question number one, are expensive eggs more ethical and humane? Now, disclaimer, I'm not trying to steer you in one way or another when it comes to the section. My goal here is to lay out all the information and differentiate the terms that actually mean something versus terms that are mostly marketing. And in short, there are two factors that affect the price of eggs. One, the egg size and grades, and two, the egg certifications. So in the US, the USDA classifies eggs into six different sizes, although you'll likely only see the largest four in supermarket. These are jumbo, very or extra large, large, medium, small, and peewee. Europe and Canada do have similar size ranges. The most commonly seen egg here in the US though is the large, which many recipes are based on, and it's the ones we'll be using for testing shortly. In general, you might have to pay a bit more to bump up in size. So the size affects the price a little bit, but you may be wondering, what does the grade of the egg even mean? Is this something I should be worried about? Well, after looking into it, it's likely not all that important. Let me explain. For sake, there is a clear difference between select, choice, and prime beef grades in regard to the marbling, which directly affects the taste and texture. But with the grades for eggs, it's a little different. First, it's important to know that USDA shell egg grading is a voluntary service paid for by shell egg producers. And generally, the USDA website says that the freshest and highest quality eggs will receive a grade AA. The next is grade A, and then grade B eggs are usually processed for liquid eggs and baking. However, what does high quality even mean? Well, if you look at the standards, which I'll have linked below, it's mostly cosmetic. There are four areas they look at, the shell, the air cell, the white, and the yolk. However, grading eggs is mostly an aesthetic exercise that is done by candling or shining lights through the eggs to assess the shells and viscosity of the interior yolks and whites, and as you can see, it's all kind of summarized in this table. In general, the firmer the egg, the fresher it is, and as an egg ages, it becomes looser and the yolk goes flatter. In cooking, tighter whites and taller standing yolks make for a prettier fried egg or a rounder poached egg and also might whip up into a meringue a little bit easier. But if you're making scrambled eggs or beating them up to add as an ingredient, you likely don't care if the yolks sit taller or the whites do too. And later in this video, we'll be testing a grade A fresh egg compared to a grade A four week old one. And the issue with grading though, is that it's applied at the production facility and you have no control over how the egg was transported. Rough transport or higher temperatures will cause eggs to loosen up and resemble older eggs. And overall, the most common egg is the large grade A. In general, the egg size and grade are minor factors if you are evaluating eggs based on ethical, nutritional, or flavor considerations like we are today. However, that begins to change when we talk about egg certifications. I bought eight different cartons of eggs throughout the making of this video, and like any other product, there are terms all over it. So with this section, we need to figure out what is the marketing versus what are verifiable terms that I should be looking out for at the grocery store. 
First, let's start with the marketing fluff. Terms like natural or all natural, fresh, farm or farmhouse, happy hens, free roaming, don't really have any regulations around them. They're likely added to the carton for marketing purposes. That changes though when we get to how they were raised where there are really four categories. One, caged eggs, two, cage-free eggs, three, free-range eggs, and lastly, pasture-raised eggs. But the question is, how different are these living conditions? First up are caged eggs. And obviously, you're not going to see the term caged eggs on the carton, but these will be the lowest cost option at the store. I picked up 18 for $3 or 17 cents for one egg. And the key here is if you don't see the other three terms on the carton, assume the chickens that laid these eggs were raised in cages. Typically, these chickens are raised in battery cages where there's very little space and fed a specific diet for maximum egg production. And today, most eggs around the world are still produced in cages of some kind, but that is starting to change. According to the Food Dive, at least nine states, from California to Massachusetts and Utah, have passed laws requiring all egg-laying hens to be housed in cage-free environments by 2024 or 2026. Additionally, major suppliers like Walmart and Kroger originally made a goal in 2016 to have 100% cage-free eggs by 2025. However, in 2022, they've admitted they will unlikely reach that goal. Regardless, the U.S. and most other countries around the world are currently in a state of transition over the next 10 to 20 years to phase out caged chickens. But the question is, what does cage-free actually mean, and how much better is it for the chicken? USDA cage-free eggs requires facilities to keep birds in an open barn or warehouse instead of those individual battery cages. And I got one dozen cage-free eggs for $2.87 or $0.24 cents per egg. These birds might have access to some open outdoor areas, but there isn't a hard regulation around a minimum space requirement, so it could still be less than one square foot per bird. And while this is likely a better situation than cages, the birds also probably stay inside and are packed together in one large area. Also, it gets a bit confusing because you can have USDA cage-free certified with the shield, but also just generic cage-free labels, which are not audited on the carton, so there's likely more variants, and it can be tough to tell exactly what the living conditions are. However, that starts to change with free range. For the free range designation, the minimum requirement is two square foot per bird. And I got these for $4 for a dozen or 33 cents per egg. Free range hens must have access to the outdoors and weather permitting. And when they are outdoors, they must be outdoors for at least six hours per day. On top of free range, you will also sometimes see the certified humane stamp. This is a third party registered 501c3 nonprofit that is dedicated to improving the lives of farm animals. And they have precise and objective standards for various farm animals, such as the difference between being allowed to use the term pasture raise versus free range. They also have a massive list of standards with regards specifically to laying hens that cover feed, water, environment, floor and litter, lighting, air quality, perches, and more. Again though, eggs with the free range label could have a significant variance in the space. The minimum is two square foot per bird and a facility could stick exactly to that number. Or if they have additional space, it could be 10 or 15 square per foot, but the penthouse of living conditions for chickens is definitely pasture raise. The Certified Humane's pasture raise requirement is 1,000 birds per 2.5 acres or 108 square feet per bird and the fields must be rotated. These hens must be outdoors year round with mobile or fixed housing where the hens can go inside at night to protect themselves from predators or for up to two weeks out of the year due only to very inclement weather. Additionally, all those same standards must be met again, which massive list if you wanna read through it. However, these are gonna be the most expensive eggs in the grocery store. I got these for $8 per dozen or 67 cents per egg. So now we're ready to answer question number one, are expensive eggs more ethical and humane? Yes, there are clear differences in how chickens are raised for laying eggs, whether it's in cages, cage-free, free-range, or pasture raise. But even within these categories, there's going to be some variability with how the chicken's living conditions are. However, if you do want to ensure that that chicken has the highest standard of living, I would look for certified humane pasture raised eggs. These by far have the strictest standards and you can read exactly what they are. 
That said, there is going to be an increased cost, and grocery budgets can be tight. For example, would it be better for a family to buy two dozen pasture-raised eggs for $16, or could they get some cage-free ones, and would that $10 be better spent on vegetables, meats, or other pantry goods? This is ultimately the human element of the food choices we make. But now, we have two more fun questions to answer, and that is, does more space, a diverse diet, and a higher standard of living make eggs healthier, and two, make them taste better? An often cited claims by various articles and videos is that more expensive eggs, such as pasture rays or organic ones, are healthier for you. But what does that mean? Like, are there any significant nutrient differences between a conventional eggs and a pasture rays one? Well, it turns out a number of studies have proved that there can be nutritional differences in different types of eggs, mainly due to the laying hen's diet. For example, there's another subcategory of eggs called nutraceutical, and it's similar to fortified milk that contains added ingredients. These farms use a hen feed enriched with fatty acid, and this increases the amount of omega-3s in the egg when it's laid. For example, an average egg may have around 90 milligrams of omega-3s per egg, but I found some free-range eggs that boast 225 milligrams and all the way up to 300 milligrams of omega-3s for a single egg. Now, it's fair to point out that most people get enough omega-3s from other foods such as nuts and seeds, plant oils, fish, and other seafood, and as noted on the NIH website, omega-3 deficiency is pretty rare in the U.S. So you may be wondering, outside of nutraceutical eggs where there are specifically added nutrients to the diet, are there any difference between conventional caged eggs and organic ones? Well, in this study on the quality of eggs, they looked at cage raised eggs, organic raised eggs, and nutraceutical, and looked at the macro and micronutrient composition as summarized in these table, and here's what they found. For macronutrients, the yolk of organic egg contained the highest protein and fat, and the albumin, or egg white, of organic eggs also contained the highest protein. For the micronutrients, there were differences as well. The conventional egg yolks were highest in iron, the organic egg yolks were highest in potassium, but the nutraceutical egg yolks were highest in calcium. And additionally, if you look through the fatty acid table, there are more differences as well. So some people may look at this and conclude that, oh yeah, organic eggs must be better for you, but I would want to point out a couple of caveats. In this study specifically, they do point out that their findings are different from another study. And secondly, if you look closer, these are pretty small amounts. In the table, it's showing differences based on 100 grams of not whole eggs, but 100 grams of egg yolk, which is around five egg yolks or so. So it's not three more grams of protein per egg. It's three more grams per roughly five egg yolks and about one more gram per 100 gram of egg whites. So if we equate that to one egg, it's like the organic ones have maybe 0.5 to a gram more protein per egg, and the whole thing could get murky pretty quickly. So to sum this up, are expensive eggs healthier for you? So there can be small macro and micronutrient differences between egg types. However, I don't know if there's nearly enough evidence to conclude blanketly that pasture rays or free range eggs are just healthier. To answer that, you would definitely first need to answer, what does the rest of your diet look like? For me, I don't eat breakfast, so I don't eat many eggs. I eat a pretty varied whole food diet with meats, carb sources, and vegetables. And if I had to put a number on it, I eat maybe four eggs a week. So if I'm looking at these findings in these various studies, these don't really do much for me. However, if I was a vegetarian whose main protein and fat source was eggs or a bodybuilder throwing back a dozen or two eggs per week, there's a conversation that organic and pasteurized eggs could have a more significant impact in helping you reach your health goals. You'll ultimately have to do more research and figure out what is best for you. So we've covered questions one and two, but now it's time for the penultimate question that kicked off this entire video. Do expensive eggs actually taste better? And my immediate next question was, wait, what do eggs even taste like? And it seems like a dumb question, but this is actually kind of confusing because we know what rotten eggs smell like, but what about fresh eggs? At a high level, these six components make up the flavor of food. Taste, aroma, texture, sight, physical, and human. And questions one and two really are dealing with the human element. More humane or nutritious eggs may make you feel better when you eat them, and thus your brain is perceiving them as having better flavor. 
But in this question, this is where we ask, from a food science perspective, do these more expensive eggs have a different taste? Do they have a different aroma? Do they have a different texture? And do they have a different sight? And in terms of appearance, that's a clear yes. You can visually see the difference in the color of the yolks, but what happens if you blindfold yourself and taste test a bunch of different eggs? Well, that's exactly what I did. But first, we need to explain the difference between the egg yolk and the eggs white, because obviously they're gonna have a different taste, texture, aroma, not to mention they react completely different when we cook with them. Michael Ruhlman has a great book called Egg where he breaks down all the different ways that you can cook with an egg. And when you start to map it out, it feels like there are almost unlimited things you can do with a single egg. So what makes an egg so unique when it comes to cooking is that it's made up of four parts. The yolk, the albumin, the membranes that separate and encase the yolks and whites, and lastly, the outer shell. Eggs are created in layers within the hen's reproductive system, starting with the yolk and then building outwards. And sometimes you can actually see these layers in a cooked egg. After the yolk, various layers of the albumin or egg white are then created to cushion the yolk within its shell. And it's important to note, there are thicker and thinner parts of the egg white, and there's even a layer of twisted protein strands that attach to the bottom and top of the yolk to suspend it in the middle of the egg. These are known as the chalaza, and it's like a built-in bungee system suspension for the yolk. So if you've ever cracked in and wondered what that opaque, twisty white little bit is, that's the chalaza. Edible and nothing to be worried about if they're visible in your eggs. Anyway, once that albumin is formed around the yolk, the uterine passage in the hen builds a shell by secreting proteins and calcium carbonate to form a mineralized and hard outer layer. Now, another common question that many people have is, is there a difference between brown and white eggs? And the shell color really has nothing to do with the diet of the hen or the quality of the egg and everything to do with the chicken's genetics. Eggshell color is unique to each hen depending on her breed and genetic, and the major breeds produce brown or white shells, but specific exotic genetics can produce speckled or even blue eggs. A lot of conventionally raised eggs are white because that is the breed of the chicken that they use, which as we learned earlier, has been really optimized for production. Now, when it comes to evaluating the flavor of the egg, we don't care about the shell. For cooking purposes, we care about the egg white and the egg yolks, which by having two separate or together is what makes eggs the most versatile ingredient on the planet. The egg white and egg yolk have massive differences in nutrition, but also structure, and these react different during cooking. And here is how the egg white and yolk contribute to a whole egg. The average shelled U.S. large egg weighs about 2 ounces or 55 grams. The egg white weighs around 38 grams or two-thirds of the total weight, with the egg yolk weighing in at 17 grams or around a third of the total weight. And probably the most obvious difference is that the egg yolk has all the fat, while the white is mostly protein with no fat. And this has massive ramifications with how they can be used in cooking. The egg white is mostly water at around 90%. But as noted in On Food and Cooking, it's made up of nine different proteins and you can see these natural functions and culinary properties. Several of these egg white proteins provide enough structure to be mechanically manipulated, such as being whipped into a meringue. Additionally, the proteins set the egg white into a firm, opaque substance when it's cooked. Interestingly though, the white is what gives cooked eggs a sulfurous aroma, not the yolk. For scrambled or fried eggs, this usually only happens if you overcook your egg whites because the denatured proteins develop hydrogen sulfide and can kind of give off that rotten egg smell. In a hard boiled egg, these same sulfur molecules react with the iron in the egg yolk, creating that green layer where the two touch. The yolk, on the other hand, is where most of the nutrients in an egg live, up to 75%, even though it's just one third of the egg's wake. An egg yolk is still around 50% water, but the rest is made up of rich proteins, fats, and minerals, and vitamins such as iron and vitamin A. And this mix of water, proteins, fats, and other substances are held together in an opaque emulsion thanks to the molecule lecithin. And this is a powerful emulsifier and makes egg yolks the go-to base for starting emulsions in many recipes. Yolks also contain pigments from the xanthophylls family, which come from plant pigments from the hen's diet. And this is what turns the yolk different shades of yellow or even orange or red. So why does the color of the yolk change so much from egg to egg? Well, it's all due to the hen's diet. Generally, a pale yellow color comes from alfalfa and corn-based diet, but now producers may add marigolds or other additive to deepen the color of the yolks in order to keep up with consumer preferences. 
And again, when you start to map all the ways you can use an egg, it almost feels like there are unlimited ways they can be used. So let's get to testing. And specifically, I decided to run five different tests split into two categories. The first three are all about fresh eggs. And then the second two are going to compare fresh eggs versus old eggs. And I'll give my observations for each so we can come up with a final answer to our question. Do expensive eggs have a better flavor? So if I was being served these, I would definitely say that the pasture raised one here looks the best for two reasons. First, it does have the deepest orange color, which just looks appealing. And secondly, it has that inner white membrane that kind of props up the egg and keeps it in the center. So visually just looking at it, it kind of looks the best of all of them. But the question is, what happens when we take away sight and just focus on taste and aroma? So after spinning and taking bites of eats, I'm really trying to see if I can pick apart any differences in the taste, texture, and aroma of the whites or the egg yolks. And I also quickly found out that eating fried eggs blindfolded is a little tricky and messy. Man, this is gonna be messy without being able to see. Great tasting egg, don't, don't really have much to say. That one again, it, I mean, it tastes like an egg, egg number three. I'm gonna have to go back to number two because it felt a little bit less rich in the yolk, but maybe I just didn't get a nice bite of yolk. But one and three to me taste basically identical. I'm gonna have to come back to number two. The whites on all these definitely taste the same though. The yolk on that one does taste a little different, not in a bad way, but... Oh, this is really hard. I don't know if there's much of a difference here. My third observation here is the whites taste exactly the same, which again are 90% water. So they're not going to have much impact on taste or aroma, but there may be some small differences in the yolk flavor. I couldn't pinpoint exactly what it is. So we've got to move on to test number two. And with the fried egg, it's a little bit hard to get bites that are exactly the same. So I think what we need to do now is a scrambled egg test and a hard boiled egg test with these same candidates. For test number two, I made four hard boiled eggs with the same candidates again. I dropped the eggs into the boiling water and set a timer for 12 minutes before tossing them into an ice bath to cool down and peeling and slicing them open. Now, what's interesting about hard boiled eggs is that one, they have a completely different texture than the fried egg in test one, and two, they have a strong aroma from the sulfur molecules reacting, which was not noticeable in the fried or scrambled eggs unless you overcook them. But are there any differences between the hard boiled eggs? Well, first, make sure you don't lose your yolk. Kinda wish these were deviled eggs, it's our hard boiled, but we had to, oh. oh no. I lost my yolk. Solid egg there, number two. It's different, but it's so subtle. And like, if you added pepper and salt to these, it would basically make it a moot point. That one maybe felt a little drier texture wise. But it's hard to say if that's due to the egg or maybe just slightly different cooking temperatures. All in all, these taste very, very similar so far. Absolutely zero clue. If there are differences, they're so minute that just adding like salt and pepper would probably negate them. I think you'd have to be some kind of egg tasting expert to be able to pick out which one is which here. So after test one and two, I found very minimal, if any differences. So I decided to switch my testing methodology from a comparison test to a triangle test. And this is where I have to pick out which one is the same and which one is different. So for test number three, I made two batches of scrambled eggs with the exact same amount of butter and salt added. One was made with the conventional eggs and the other were the pasture raised eggs. And again, we can clearly see some differences visually, but what about the taste, texture, and aroma? Three, same amount of salt, same amount of butter. Let's do egg number one. Tastes like what I would expect it to. Number two. I'm not sure if those are different or not. I'm gonna go to number three though. But if I had to guess, I think one and three are the same. I think two is different. As far as which one is which, absolutely no idea. So I did guess correctly which one was which, but 
Again, I don't really know what I'm basing that off of. It could just be the way those eggs happen to be layered in there with the texture. I tried to get them as close as I could, obviously, use the exact same method, but there's still gonna be slight differences in the scrambled eggs, even though I think I did do them really close. And then as far as taste and aroma goes, that's really not an indicator for me that I'm pulling out on. And again, you have to remember, this is just butter salt eggs. As soon as they add black pepper, you serve this with bacon, put it on a sandwich, just over time, it's gonna be lost even more. This is the most purest form of eggs, but yeah, it's definitely pretty interesting. That being said, there is still one more test we need to do. So I was not able to come up with any significant differences from any flavor aspects here. However, some people would say that instead of cage-free versus pasture-raised or free range, what will change the flavor of an egg more is the longer it has sat in your refrigerator due to deterioration. So for these final tests, we'll be using 30 day old pasteurized eggs that I bought at the store compared to ones that I bought just a day ago. But first, you may be wondering, how does an egg deteriorate over time? Well, as noted on Food of Cooking, there are kind of three different things that go on. First, the egg loses moisture, so the contents of the egg shrink and the air cell also expands. This is why if you have an egg that floats instead of sinks, it means it's really old and should probably be thrown away. Second, from a chemical perspective, the egg becomes more alkaline due to the loss of carbon dioxide through the shell, and this could potentially affect the taste. And then third, the albumin or egg white thins out and the yolk membranes become weaker. So in general, the older an egg is, the thinner and runnier the white is, the more likely the yolk is to break, the air cell will expand, and lastly, the taste may change a little bit. However, how much of a difference can we really expect here? So for test number four, I made fried eggs with only pasture-raised eggs, except one with the carton I bought 30 days ago and one I bought yesterday. And right away, you can take a look at these side by side and really see the difference. So I can definitely confirm that the older egg whites were much thinner and runnier just when I immediately cracked them out. You can totally tell that is a difference. And I think that might make a difference in something like a meringue, which I'm gonna test in just a second. But again, this more seems like a visually thing, like this stayed perfectly in the center, these kind of splayed out. But again, this probably only matters for a fried egg, but let's see if there is any difference in taste here. So again, for this test, I blindfolded up, spun them around, and then took off three and then left out one. And my goal is to see if I could pick out which are the same and which ones are different. Now I'm thinking the texture of the whites is really just gonna give this away. I'll try to pop the yolk and just get yolk, if I can do that. So let's go down into egg number one. Exactly what I want my yolk to taste like. Okay, I definitely got some yolk there. That yolk tasted a little bit different than this one, if I had to guess. Let me go to number three, though. Number one definitely tastes richer to me. I think. Uh, nah. mm, I don't know. I'm gonna guess one and two are the same and number th three is different. Yeah, there is just a slight difference in kind of the taste and aroma here, but again, it's very slight. It still tastes like an egg. There's no way I would be able to pick this randomly if I was just served this and be like, yo, is this, is this your finest 30 day old egg, sir? These look better and technically, yes. I do prefer kind of the taste, and, but this is, it's so close. It's probably 90% of the way there. Yeah. You probably wouldn't even notice this in a scrambled egg once you actually mix everything together. But in this specific test, yeah, there is a little bit of a difference. So now I think we can safely answer our final question. Do expensive eggs taste better? And based on my testing, I would say this is definitely a no. There may be slight differences in taste, aroma, and texture, and I was able to pick out which one was different in the triangle test, but in no way did any of them have a significantly better or worse flavor. And also, I kept these extremely plain with just butter and salt. As soon as you add pepper or throw an egg on a sandwich, it's gonna be even harder to tell. The one obvious caveat is sight. 
And this, you could totally argue, is enough to warrant using the more expensive eggs anytime you're making a dish where the color of the yolks are a really important part. Having deeper colored deviled eggs, an enriched challah bread with bread dough, or richly colored hollandaise sauce absolutely will influence our psychological perception of flavor. So in conclusion, here are my key takeaways for this video. One, are expensive eggs more ethical and humane? And yes, there are clear differences in how chickens are treated when it comes to laying eggs, and where you land on that is ultimately up to you. But if you do want to ensure the highest standard of living, look for pasture-raised, certified humane eggs. Secondly, are expensive eggs healthier for you? There can be small macro and micronutrient differences between different egg types. However, you would definitely need to evaluate the rest of your diet and lifestyle to see if that makes sense for you. Lastly, do the expensive eggs test better? No, there may be very minor differences in taste, texture, and aroma, but nothing to be considered better or worse. However, there is a clear difference in sight, which may matter a lot depending on what you're making with them. Personally, I don't eat a ton of eggs, so I don't mind spending the extra money on a dozen pasture-raised eggs that I'll likely use over the course of two or three weeks. But I could totally see with how a family or an egg-heavy diet that that cost could really add up. In my family growing up, we actually had chickens that laid our own eggs because with four boys in the house, we would fly through dozens of eggs. So in conclusion, I hope you have all of the information you need to make an informed and confident decision the next time you are navigating through the egg aisle at the grocery store. And thank you again for watching the video. These are a ton of fun to make. Hopefully they're valuable as well. Every time we do them, I learn so many more things than I didn't even realize that I wanted to know, and then I can implement it into my cooking. But anyway, that will wrap it up for me in this one. I will catch you all in the next one. Peace, y'all.